Royal Professor Unku Aziz Public Lecture 2019, Unku Aziz Centre for Development Studies, University of Malaya. The objective of this lecture series is to acknowledge the contributions of Royal Professor Unku Aziz in the field of poverty and development research in Malaysia. The aim of this public lecture is to host national figures who have made outstanding contribution to the nation's development while providing a platform for exchanging ideas, debates and discourse in the area of poverty and development studies. This platform is also open to distinguished academics and individuals who have contributed to the national and international development discourse. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Shamsul Bariaku Ahmad, Director, Unku Aziz Centre for Development Studies, University of Malaya, to deliver her welcoming speech and introduce the chairperson for today's lecture. Please welcome. Thank you very much. <coughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum, Salam Sejahtera, and a very good morning to you. Um, I would like to thank you for choosing to be with us uh, today. Uh, I have been very pleased with the response that we have received uh, throughout the six weeks of Professor Ravayon's uh, visit and also that of our visiting professor, Dr. Dominic uh, van der Velde. Just a brief uh, recap uh, for those who have not been following us very much. The chair, the Royal Professor Nku Aziz Chair, is an endowment chair. Uh, this was established way back in 2006 as a result of a cabinet decision. Malaysian cabinet decided to establish the Royal Professor Nku Aziz Chair to honour Pak Nku's contribution uh, in the field of poverty and development studies, uh, especially rural development, uh, education and institution building, uh, among others. So the center's role uh, basically is to facilitate the uh, activities of the chair. I would also like to thank uh, our funders, endowment funders, for making this chair possible. They are, of course, the uh, University of Malaya, uh, Kementerian Pendidikan, Petronas, Yayasan San Dabi, the Employees Provident Fund, Bank Rakyat, and also uh, PNB, Permodalan National. Uh, Pak Nku turned 97 yesterday. So if he could be here, I, I'm sure he would be very pleased uh, to meet you, Martin and uh, Dominic. Uh, we also uh, have the privilege of holding the stock of his book, Writing for the Nation. So if any of you are interested on behalf of your organizations especially to have to receive a copy, uh, further information regarding that I think is available at the, the front desk. So it took us a long time to get to today. As you know, the history of the center has evolved from uh, CPDF to Nku Aziz from the first chair, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, until today, uh, Professor Martin uh, Ravayon is here to take up uh, this position. Uh, for that, I also would like to thank the university management. There are some uh, uh, representatives from the university management, and of course, from the, uh, the faculty. The former dean, uh, Prof Azina, uh, asked me to come to the center to, to do some work and I'm very pleased uh, today to deliver whatever she has asked me to do and extra with uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Dominic Van Waal as well as an, a bonus for us. Uh, and of course uh, uh, Dr. Rohana has been very supportive. Uh, the Jawatan Kuasa Pengurusan uh, Kursi, uh, the Chair Management Committee has been very supportive of what I have proposed in terms of ideas, uh, the, the outlook, future outlook for the center, we would not be here today if it is not for their support. And also the support of the staff of the Nkwazi Center, 
they have been working very hard for the last three years to make sure today happens. So thank you very much, uh, the staff of Uncle Aziz Centre. Okay, uh, today's public lecture is on income inequality, challenges for measurement and uh, policy. Davos has just ended. Inequality is still uh, hotly debated. Uh, gender gap. Oxfam again has published a report about the uh, riches uh, uh, and the poorest. Uh, so the question here perhaps that we are all asking, where are we heading? with poverty and with inequality. Uh, so let us have a listen to uh, Martin's uh, lecture and ask the questions, the hard questions that we need to ask. He loves to engage, he loves questions, so we should not uh, spare him from the hard questions that we have uh, on our minds. Before, I, uh, I, uh, before we start the public lecture, I would like to introduce you to the chairperson. Juan Haja Yatela. She is the CEO of the Saim Dhabi Foundation, the philanthropic uh, arm of the Saim Dhabi Group. Uh, she has a vast experience in uh, corporate social responsibility. She has a degree in accounting and finance from uh, Aberystwyth University, uh, sorry, from the University of Wales, Ab Aberystwyth, and she's also a chartered accountant. So I would like to invite Hajayatella and Prof. Martin to the stage to start the session. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat salam sejahtera. Uh, yang dihormati Sosial Profesor Dr. Ruhana Jani, Dean, Faculty of Engin uh, Economics and Administration. Yang dihormati Dr. Shamsul Bariah Gu Ahmad, Director of the Unko Aziz Centre for Development Studies. Professor Martin Revelian, he asked me to pronounce it in English. Uh, the Royal uh, Professor Unko Aziz Chairholder, representatives from the Federal Government of Malaysia, corporate bodies, uh, NGOs and research institutes, including local, regional and international, I understand. Academicians, researchers, and students. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to extend a very warm welcome on behalf of the Unku Aziz Center for Development Studies, University of Malaya, to all of our guests for joining us today at this public lecture. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge University Malaya's uh, vice chancellors, um, as well as Dr. Samsul Baria's. Uh, uh, efforts uh, who have extended their unwavering support to the chair all these years. Um, we at uh, Yayasan Saim Dhabi and other important funders such as the MOE, Petronas, EPF, PNB and Bank Rakyat are thrilled to be a part of this event. Now the Unku Aziz Centre for Development Studies, previously known as the Centre for Poverty and uh, Development Studies, is created to facilitate the activities of the Royal Professor Unku Aziz Chair. The chair was established to honour the contributions of the Royal Professor uh, uh, Unku Aziz Unku ah Abdul Hamid in the field of education and economic development, especially rural development and poverty. The aim of this public lecture is to not only host national figures who have made outstanding contributions to the na nation's development, but to also provide a platform to present new ideas and research on the area of poverty and development studies for debate. Hopefully we'll have an interesting one today. This platform is also open to distinguished academics and individuals who have contributed to national and international discourses on the subject matter. Now today we have with us, we're very uh, privileged to have with us uh, Professor Martin Revelian. Um, uh, Professor Revelian is a prominent economist who has made significant contributions to the international discourse on Poverty development. He is renowned for his groundbreaking works in the field of poverty. Today's lecture is a part of a series of events held during uh, Professor Rebellion's first visit to the University of Malaya as the holder of uh, the chair. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take a moment to introduce our speaker for today's lecture. Professor Martin Rebellion holds the inaugural Edmund Di Chair of Economics at Georgetown University. 
Professor Revelian is an Australian citizen, studied at the University of Sydney and obtained his PhD in the London School of Economics. Prior to joining Georgetown, he was the director of the World Bank's research department. Professor Revelian has advised numerous governments and international studies um, and international agencies on poverty and has proposed policies to overcome this problem. Now, besides poverty, his writing also covers other subjects in economics, which includes six books and over 250 papers in scholarly journals and edited volumes. His latest book, The Economics of Poverty, History, Measurement and Policy, was published by Oxford University Press in 2016. He's also the past president of the Society for the Study of Economic Inequality, a senior fellow of the Bureau for Research in Economic Analysis of Development, a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research USA, and a non-resident fellow of the Center for Global Development. Now, among all the various prizes and awards that he has received, he was also awarded the John Kenneth Galbraith Prize from the American Agricultural and Applied Economics Association in 2012. And he received a Frontiers of Knowledge Award from Spain's BBVA Foundation in 2016. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Valian to deliver his lecture entitled Income Inequality, Challenges for Measurement and Policy. Great, thank you very much. Um, it's really been a, an honour to um, come here to the University of Malaya to, um, uh, for the Ungo Aziz, uh, um, Royal Ungo Aziz Chair Holder. And um, a really special thanks to Dr. Shamsul and her team, terrific hosts, and, and all the friends we've made in this uh, uh, six week period. Um, of course, we'll be, we'll be back. We're leaving the end of this week. Um, and we really enjoyed it. It's been great interaction and um, uh, um, terrific time. Um, what I'm going to talk to you uh, about today is a, a topic that um, is getting a lot of attention um, globally. It's, it's certainly in this country, but, but in the country I live in, the United States, and the country I, I grew up in, Australia, but all over the world, uh, increasing attention. What I'm going to do today is talk about two things. How are we doing? Just an overview of what we know about our progress against poverty and our, as we're going to see, relative lack of progress against inequality. Here I'm going to summarize the received wisdom, what I call the received wisdom, the, the, the most mainstream view. I'm also going to look at some dissenting views, including dissenting views I have, but others as well. In all of this, I'm going to take a global perspective and treat all citizens of the world as citizens of the world, and we're going to look at inequality and poverty in the world as a whole. But I'm also going to use this as an opportunity to say a few things about what's been happening in Malaysia. Things I've learned in, in the period um, I've, I've been here and uh, previously. I'm going to, then going to say a, a few things about how we might do better. Here I'm going to talk about public action, including government policies. I'm going to talk about that in, in, a, in a broad way and, and then narrow it down to talk about some specific policies uh, and a kind of brief overview of what we've learned from a great deal of research on those policies. And finally, I'm going to make some recommendations about um, uh, how we should think about better policies going forward. Okay, first the received wisdom. Um, when I say received wisdom, I guess I mean what um, people who work on the, in the academics who work on this, in this field or researchers working in this field think. It doesn't mean everybody knows this and you actually might find there are some surprises. Um, short history of global inequality. Global inequality was rising in the world as far back as we could see. Most of the data starts in the early um, 18th, the 18th century, 19th century. The best data starts around 1820, uh, particularly from um, work of Angus Madison and uh, Francois Bouillon, Christian Morrison and others. But the picture that emerges is one of rising inequality until 
the late 20th century, something happened dramatically. The pattern changed. We suddenly moved to a world of falling global inequality. This may be a surprise. Falling global inequality? Yeah. The way economists measure global inequality, the received wisdom, is that it's falling, it's not rising. This picture gives the best estimates we have. This is um, from work by Francois Bourguignon, um, using some of my data and other data. Um, the top line is a measure of total global inequality. Now, I emphasize this is the received wisdom. I'm going to try to unpack this, and you're going to learn about the assumptions underlying these measures. Total global inequality. Next line down, inequality between countries. And finally, inequality within countries. You can think of global inequality as the sum of inequality between countries and inequality within countries. Global inequality is falling, and it's mainly driven by falling inequality between countries. What's happening? Well, it's, it's the growth of countries like Malaysia, but especially countries like China and India. Uh, low income, initially low-income countries growing, that's a force for reducing global inequality, and it's a huge force. It's swamping what is happening within countries globally, and there we're seeing a rise, small upward creep in average inequality within countries, and that's what you see. I'm going to focus a lot on that lower line because I actually think that's what's getting, uh, understandably, getting a lot more attention. People are interested in inequality within their own country. But I want to keep that, I want you to remember, globally, inequality, as, I've, as it's normally defined, we're going to come back to that, as it's normally defined, is falling, it's not rising. Now, within many countries, we do see rising inequality. Within developing countries, another um, popular view that isn't borne out by the evidence is that inequality is rising everywhere, but it's not. Rising in about half the developing country world and falling in the rest. In Malaysia, it's falling. In Brazil, it's falling. Famously, it's rising in China until recently, and now it's stopped rising, it's flattened out. It's rising in India, rising in about half the growing economies and falling in the other half. We're also seeing a process of inequality convergence going on. We're tending to see inequality rising in low inequality countries and falling in high inequality countries. In other words, the world is kind of slowly moving toward one distribution of income. Slowly, I emphasize. It's going to take a long time before it reaches that, but it, it's happening. It's pretty robust. We're also seeing falling absolute poverty. Alongside this tendency for falling global inequality, we're seeing falling absolute poverty. In the developing world as a whole, I've given you here on the vertical axis the headcount index of poverty, the proportion of people living below an international poverty line. It's the World Bank's international poverty line. We don't need to talk about that. You can ask about it if you like. Um, and here's the picture for Malaysia. This is from the official data, the official measures. Uh, both are falling over time. We're also seeing a process in which economic growth has been associated with falling poverty. This is a compilation of data across all developing countries. What about Malaysia? This is the first time anybody has seen this, except Dominique. I constructed it last night. Uh, it took a lot of work for a reason that I might come back to, to do with your data availability. But I found a way. This is what I call the growth incidence curve. This is something I, I developed in the early 2000s. And uh, it's a nice way of, of summarizing the changes in the overall distribution of income in countries. So we all know what a growth rate is, right? The growth rate of GDP per capita, the growth rate of average income, yeah? In Malaysia, 
the growth rate of average income, average household income per person is about 2.5% per annum per person over the period from 1984 to 2016. Given the constraints on data, I, I can't go back before 1984 for this picture. I can for some other things I'm going to show you. So that red line, that's the mean growth rate. That's the, that's the growth rate of the mean. Not the mean growth rate. Growth rate of the mean. Now, if you think about that, you, we all know the growth rate is the mean. It's a very familiar statistic. But where is that in the distribution of income? Well, you can see, I've given you here, by percentiles, poorest to the richest. So here, that, that, that's the median, the, growth, the, the, the 50th percentile. And there's the growth rate at the median. The growth rate at the mean in Malaysia is somewhere near the 90th percentile. So when newspapers and quote the growth rate of the mean, GDP per capita or mean household income, they're quoting a statistic that is telling you about some, how some of the richest people in this country are, are doing. It's telling, giving you a statistic that's focusing on somewhere around the 90th percentile from the bottom, 10th percentile from the top. It's hardly representative of living standards. Much better, I think, to look at the growth rate of the median. That's a bit higher in Malaysia. But we don't have to just look at that. We can look at the whole distribution. And that's what I've given you here. This is the, the hard thing to calculate that I talked about. For other countries, it's very easy. Um, that blue line is the growth incidence curve. So the poorest in Malaysia over this period, over this 32-year period, the poorest have seen a growth rate 3.4%, very slightly higher. It peaks at about the fifth percentile. And then it's falling through to the very top. That, that, that's kind of good. That's the sort of thing, growth incidence curve, we'd like to see. Now, many developing countries have not had that kind of experience. So Malaysia is fortunate. You want a growth process that benefits the poorest people. This is good news. If I drew that curve for China, let me try and I know exactly what it looks like. Let me try and I'll draw it for you. It looks like this. It goes from, um, no, actually a bit higher. It looks like this. Yeah, it goes from a, a relatively low level up to about 12% per annum. So Malaysia's overall economic development from the point of view of inequality is looking pretty good. So naturally, poverty rates are falling. Obviously, if you know this, see this picture, we're seeing uh, positive growth all through the distribution. Uh, in economics, we call this first-order dominance. It just means that any statement you make about poverty is robust to the poverty line. But if we look at the official poverty line, these are the numbers we get. And I've given you here a breakdown by ethnic group, Bumaputra, Chinese, Indian, the three main ethnic groups of, of Malaysia. We're seeing a, a sharp decline in overall, over this period, this is going from 1970 to 2016, uh, a decline in the overall poverty rate. And it's shared by all three ethnic groups. We're seeing this long-run decline in inequality. Well, that's obvious from my growth incidence curve. But here I give you the, the famous Gini index falling for Malaysia. Now, there are a lot of, underneath all this data, we've got all kinds of qualifications. I already mentioned the problems of of access to data in this country, which I'm going to come back to. Um, problems of the quality of the published tabulations as well. Uh, but there are also problems underneath the, the survey data. Getting people to agree to be surveyed. It's increasingly difficult to get rich people, particularly, to participate in household surveys. It's difficult to get a lot of people to participate in household surveys. But when we have a, a non-random assignment of people, uh, a non-random sample of people who choose to be interviewed, there are concerns. So actually I suspect inequality is higher than we think in Malaysia from the official statistics. I, I think it's probably still falling. I don't have any too much doubt about that. But the level 
the level here is a bit unclear. And that's important because although inequality is falling in Malaysia, the actual level of inequality is high. It's falling from a very high level to a not so high level, but it's pretty high by international standards. Um, it's about the level of the United States, for example, which is considered a reasonably high inequality country. We're also seeing in that process of inequality falling, we're seeing ethnic convergence. Uh, that has a, a narrow definition and a broad definition. Here I'm using the narrow definition. Here I just mean that the um, mean for the Bumaputra, the poorest group, starting in the initial condition, is, is falling, uh, sorry, rising relative to the overall mean, and the mean for the richest group is falling relative to the overall mean. So we see this process of ethnic convergence. We see these lines moving together. Uh, this process will end up hopefully with a situation where everybody's got roughly the same average income. We're also seeing, very importantly, inequality falling within each of the three main ethnic groups. This is not, the, fall of the process of inequality falling in Malaysia is definitely not just a process of ethnic convergence. It's a process of inequality falling within each of the three major ethnic groups. And that process of falling inequality within each of the three groups is actually a much more important dynamic for poverty reduction in this country than convergence in the means between the three ethnic groups. The fall in absolute poverty in this country, again, this is the received wisdom and, and I'm going to offer some critical comments on all of this in a moment. The received wisdom is, is clear. The, the bulk of the reduction in, in, in poverty is due to economic growth. When I say the bulk, I mean precisely three quarters. Three quarters of the reduction in poverty over this period from 1970 to 2016, the latest available year, two th sorry, three quarters is, is attributable in a narrow statistical sense is attributable to growth in mean income and the other one quarter is due to that fall in inequality. Now one quarter is a big chunk. Uh, that's not saying inequality is unimportant, that's important. But keep in mind the bulk, three quarters, is economic growth. Okay, a few things here that are, are, are kind of, the way I put it here is, is roughly right. The, the, uh, a lot of what I said is, all of what I said is true, believe me. Um, but some of what I said is actually out of step with popular thinking. And that's actually important to know and to understand. Because if we're going to form a consensus about fighting inequality in the world, we're going to have to talk to each other, we're going to have to understand each other. And that's not happening. It's partly not happening because different people have different concepts of inequality. Inequality is a big word. It's too big a word. And we have to unpack the concept and understand how different people perceive things like inequality. What I'm going to talk about is three things that worry me. Um, lack of attention to absolute inequality and in the received wisdom. First. Second. Lack of attention to the living standards of the very poorest in society. And finally, lack of attention to relative income. We think a lot in terms of welfare, your welfare depending on your own income, but we also learnt from research by psychologists, sociologists and economists that uh, people care about their relative position as well. So all three things. The first is a real, I think, a real wake-up call to economists. Um, progressively over time we've, we've come to realise that maybe half the population of the world, that's a wild guess on my part, it's based on surveys and for mostly for university students and surveys that I've done, um, they don't think about inequality the way I've described it in all those graphs. And the important difference is they think about inequality in absolute terms, not relative terms. I'm not saying all people think of this way, it's about half and half. There are both absolutists and relativists. Absolutists think about inequality in terms of absolute gaps 
between rich and poor. Relativists, like many economists, including me, I'm a relativist, relativists think about inequality in terms of ratios. They look at how people are doing relative to the mean. And everything I've shown you so far is relativist. That's the textbook wisdom in economics. But there are both absolutists and relativists. And it's not that one's right and the other's wrong. They're actually based on two different axioms of inequality measurement. In the theory of inequality measurement, we've understood this back to at least to Serge Colm in 1968. And we've understood that there is this difference. And we trace it back to an axiom of inequality measurement. Let's be more precise about that. See those distributions A and B? State A, incomes 1, 2, 3. State B, incomes 2, 4, 6. The way economists conventionally measure inequality, there is no difference between those two distributions. They have the same inequality. That's based on what's called the scale independence axiom. The axiom says that the measure of inequality should be invariant to multiplying by a scalar. The alternative is translation invariance, and that's what how absolutists think. Translation invariance means that inequality is unchanged by adding a constant. I'm not going to do a survey of this room. I'm going to let you think to yourself. See those two distributions, A and B. Do you think inequality is higher in B than A? There's no right or wrong answer. All right, let's do a survey. Put your hands up if you think inequality is higher in B than A. Okay. So the rest of you think no difference? Put up your hand if you think there's no difference. Good. I don't think anybody put their hand up twice, but um, that's very good. Um, some of you are still sitting worrying, wondering, which is... But there's no, again, I emphasise, it's not right and wrong. My students, I've done this for about 500 students at Georgetown, and about half are absolutists and half are relativists. Students in Hebrew University of Jerusalem, students at London School of Economics, students at Hamburg, uh, same, same basic result. Some people are absolutists, some people are relativists. And, and there's, not, there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, some econ um, Dominique, my wife, is a, a PhD economist like me. She's an absolutist and I'm a relativist. And we get along fine. It's not a, it's not a problem. It's not a, really not a problem at all. But you have to understand, if you talk about inequality, you have to understand whether the other person, the person you're talking to is absolutist or relativist, because otherwise you won't see the same reality, you, you'll see the same reality in completely different ways. Uh, I've seen this, uh, come across this at times in, my, in the field, in development work, uh, you know, I, kind of, I meet with people in an NGO, look at the same village, they say inequality is rising in this village, and I say inequality is not changing. They're absolutists and I'm relativists. They see that you know, the rich guy uh, gets a car and the poor guy just gets to fix his, fix his bicycle, but inequality is so high in the village that the ratio of their incomes hasn't changed. But I think the absolutist perspective is entirely legitimate. And if you don't understand that perspective, you won't have a meaningful dialogue on, on inequality. Debates about inequality are often debates between absolutists and relativists. It's just not widely understood. Here are those Gini indices again, but this time I give you a, the, the ordinary relativist Gini index and I give you uh, my calculation of an absolutist Gini index. And the difference is simply whether you normalize by the mean. Between 1988 and 2008 in the world as a whole, Relative Gini has fallen, absolute Gini has risen substantially. This is what it looks like for Malaysia. So here's that falling relative inequality I showed you, the falling relative Gini index. What is the absolute Gini index doing? The absolute gaps between the rich and the poor are rising. They're not falling. And there's actually very few places in the world where 
absolute gaps are falling. But we have to realize that. If you think about equality in absolute terms, you will see a different reality. Ethnic convergence that I showed you in, in Malaysia, yes, as a relativist, if you're a relativist, you'll see ethnic convergence. If you're absolutist, you'll see ethnic divergence. Here I've given you, over time, the difference, the absolute difference in real terms, real income, 2010 prices, but the absolute difference in, in incomes between the Chinese and the Bhumiputra, Chinese and Indian, and Chinese and Indian and Bhumiputra. They're rising over time. Coming alongside falling poverty, coming alongside a rising overall mean, coming alongside rising means within each ethnic group, falling relative inequality within each ethnic group, but we are seeing rising absolute gaps. When I said before that um, economic growth is, is reducing absolute poverty, uh, it's roughly half the time in growing developing countries inequality is rising, half the time it's falling. All true. Look at absolute inequality, the relationship is very different. With economic growth, we tend to see rising absolute inequality. In the mathematics of this, there's nothing very surprising. It's very simple points I'm making in the math. But they're, they're quite profound points when you think about the difference in perception of reality. And we can't hide from this. We've got to recognize these differences. We, we also can't hide absolutists in the audience. You can't hide from what I think is a dilemma you're going to face if you're an absolutist. The tendency for absolute inequality to rise with growth points to a potential trade-off between reducing absolute inequality and reducing poverty. The surest way to reduce absolute inequality is contract economies. Not a real good idea. There's actually a whole um, anti-growth movement in the world. Um, small but growing. But I don't think they're going to get very far. We want a better kind of growth, more equitable growth, sure, uh, a more environmentally sustainable growth, and hopefully we're going to get it. But the idea of contracting an economy to reduce absolute inequality, I don't think it's going to get very far, but, but absolutists need to confront that trade-off. For relativists, it's not an issue. So clearer, greater clarity is needed from the absolutists about that trade-off going forward. Another point, I mean, for anybody here who's studied inequality measurement, there's a famous axiom, another axiom, not scale independence or translation invariance that I mentioned, another axiom called, called the transfer principle. And the transfer principle says that if you transfer money from a rich person to a poor person, inequality must fall. Very natural. Before I started doing these surveys of my students, I, I thought everybody's got to accept that, surely. And I realized my students generally do accept it, but not always. Here's a situation. I haven't just done university students, I've also done a Twitter survey if you, you know, to add to another bias survey on top of a, 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 another bias survey. My Twitter audiences, I do these little Twitter surveys. Um, there are such things. Some of you are looking a bit blank. You know? um, Twitter. You know? Okay, Twitter. Um, the, you know, if I look at, um, see this distribution, 2, 5, 5, 10, 2, 4, 4, 6, 10. So those again are, are income levels. You think of it as dollar a day if you like, or in Malaysia. Or, dollar an hour maybe. Um, here I've redistributed income within the middle income group. See, it's more equitable. I've transferred a dollar from this the third person and given it to the second person. So inequality has fallen by the transfer axiom. But many people don't agree with that. They look at this distribution in a different way. And this is kind of an important point, so bear with me. They look at it, they see in this distribution they see that the, 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 the top guy, is the, the middle is even further from the top, and the poor are even further from the middle. 
you've stretched the distribution in relative terms. And they object to that. And I actually understand that. Yeah, I, I, well, I'm generally, the transfer axiom is fine. I like the transfer axiom. But, but, but people, when people look at distribution, they look at, often look at how rich the rich are relative to the middle and how the poor the poorest are relative to the middle. I'll come back to that when we talk about those two extremes in, in a little while. Okay, one aspect of those extremes is the very poorest. And here's another dissenting view. The way we measure poverty in the world is remarkably uninformed about how the poorest people in the world are doing. Remarkably. I, I didn't realize this until quite recently, but um, I used to read these quotes. This is a, you hear things like this all the time. This first one is a quote from the ex-UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. For the poorest of the world are being left behind. We need to reach out and lift them into our lifeboat. Um, Guy Ryder, the Director General of the ILO. Poverty is not yet defeated. Far too many people are being left behind. Well, I, I used quotes, quotes like that, and I, my first reaction was, what? Haven't they read my papers? Don't they know poverty is falling? Don't they know economic growth is reducing absolute poverty across the world? Uh, haven't they read the literature? Then I started to think, well, you know, when economists say, economists like me are saying things like a rising tide lifts all boats, growth is good for the poor, breakthrough from the bottom. There's a complete, they're telling completely different stories. So either one's wrong and the other's right, or they're looking at different aspects of the distribution. Let's look at it this way. Here I've given you two graphs. On the left, two growth, in, uh, two not growth incidence curves, two community distribution functions. So this is, these are giving you the percentage of people living below each point on the horizontal axis, and for two distributions. All right. Again, think of that as a distribution. Okay, we're seeing falling poverty going from this distribution to that distribution, given the poverty line, there's a big reduction in poverty. So, similarly on the right, a big fall in the poverty rate. But there's a huge and very important difference that that poverty statistic is missing about the two curves. The one on the right, look at the very bottom. The one on the right, the lowest level of living has stayed the same. They intersect at the same, at the very bottom. The one on the, the left, they remain the same. The one on the right, the floor has risen. Yet the poverty measure has fallen by roughly the same amount. But the poverty measure is telling us nothing about how the very poorest people are doing. What does it look like for the world? Well, this is for the developing world. Here I've given you between 1981 and 2011, this 30-year um, period, the community distribution functions for the developing world. There's a lot of calculations here. I'm using data for like Two million, a sample of 2 million households globally constructed by pooling 1,500 household surveys, the micro data from 1,500 household surveys, right? None of which are from Malaysia. Actually, that's not true for recent years. None of the older ones. But the, Malaysia doesn't have much weight here. The population is, is relatively small, so it's not an issue. But what I wanted to show you is, look at the blue line below. This is the absolute gain by percentile. That is just the, the horizontal differences in these community distribution functions, the horizontal differences by percentile. 
And there you see it, the floor has not risen. The floor is the lower bound of living standards, the level of income below which nobody is found. It's not the subsistence level. Obviously the floor in the United States is about five, it's about five, believe me, it's about five dollars a day, well above survival level, about a dollar a day. It's the, level, the lower bound of the distribution. Okay? And the lower bound of the distribution of the developing world has not risen over this 30 year period. In other words, what we've done is reduce numbers of people living in poverty, numbers of people living near the floor, but we haven't raised the floor. The rich world, today's rich world, when it was poor, and in 1820, the United States of America was, was as poor as sub-Saharan Africa today, actually poorer. When the United States eliminated extreme poverty, it lifted, when the whole of the OECD, rich world, when it eliminated absolute poverty, it raised the floor substantially more than we're seeing in the developing world. There's a strange irony, the developing world is faster than the rich, it's faster at reducing numbers of poor than the rich world was. It took the rich world roughly twice the time to achieve the same reduction in poverty. But the rich world was better at raising the floor. The answer which I'm going to come back to is social policy. Social policy in the developing, in the developing world has been much less effective at reaching the poorest people. You've all maybe heard of the elephant graph by Branko Milanovic. The elephant graph is the growth incidence curve for the developing world as a whole and it looks like an elephant. So you know what a growth incidence curve is now, percentiles on the horizontal axis, growth rates on the vertical axis over time. Yeah? It's an elephant with a, a rising trunk. Uh, that's got a, all got an explanation. I mean, here we've got um, some people look at this and they say, oh, that's uh, Donald Trump's base. Relatively poor, lower middle class people in the rich world, in the United States for example, who have seen very little growth. I, I think that's a bit not quite right as a characterization of Donald Trump's base, but put that aside. And then we're seeing Donald Trump's beneficiaries as distinct from his base. Now these are the guys up here. Right? Substantial growth from, for example, his tax reforms. But in the middle there, in the middle we've got uh, that hump of the elephant is a substantial rise in proportionate terms of incomes in the developing world. And all the way at the bottom, very little change. The way Branko constructed his curve, um, he left out the bottom, but believe me, the bottom, it just goes down to zero. Well, that's Branko's elephant curve. Here's my serpent curve. I've taken exactly his data. Branko's a, a dear old friend, so I can do anything to his curve. He's still here. He's very still stay friends. Anyway, there's my curve. What have I done? I've just taken the absolute gains rather than the relative gains. So that hump in absolute terms is really small. Again, it looks more like a, a serpent than an elephant. And up the top there, it's shooting. We don't even know how high because we don't measure it very well because the super rich do not participate in surveys. I bet Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Bezos, if they ever participated in the CPS in the United States, the current population survey, I'd be amazed. But we're lit, we're lit, that top, very top is just not in the data. Here's Malaysia's absolute growth incidence curve. So remember the good news, the relative growth incidence curve looks great. Or, you know, it could look better, <laughs> but it's not as bad as in many places. The absolute growth in curve is seeing absolute after absolute gains for the, for the better off. And that's consistent with that absolute Gini index I showed you before. What about the floor? Here I've given you my estimate of the lower bound of the distribution of, of consumption in the developing world. 
again constructed from this huge compilation of household survey data. Um, there's a whole lot of messy maths and stuff about how it's not so messy, it's actually beautiful maths, but looks might look messy to you. I'm not going to go into it. About how you get to that floor, how you get to the estimate, it's actually a quite difficult thing to estimate because household surveys are not designed to estimate the lowest level of living, they're designed to estimate the mean of whatever statistic you're looking at. So here, two things to note. For the developing world as a whole, new trajectory since 2000. Overall mean rising at 4% per annum. Double the prior historical growth rate. That's terrific news. That's great. That's what's driving down global inequality, as I said before. The high growth rates in developing countries. Not all, but a lot of them. And not just East Asia, across, across all of the developing world, including Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, that was the first point. Second point, look what's happening to the floor. So that growth that started in 2000 is not pulled up the floor. The level of living of the poorest people in the developing world has stayed the same. It's not reaching the very poorest. Well, a qualification on that, that line, that orange line there, does have a statistically significant positive slope. Yeah, it does. But that's just telling us how deceptive statistical significance can be. You can see it yourself. The floor has risen very little over the longer term. Here are my calculations for Malaysia. The floor has risen a bit more in Malaysia than the developing world as a whole. I mean, noticeably more. From $2.30, I estimate, at purchasing power parity, 2011 base, to $3 per person per day. It's, it's risen, that's good, it's, it's risen, it's risen. But certainly nothing like the overall mean. Today, the overall mean is about $28 a day, international dollars. Uh, the floor is about $3. Last of the three of the trilogy on, on dissenting views is relative income. Here I want to go back to Ungoziz. Now, I'd, I'd heard of his Sarong Index. People who work on poverty knew about Ungoziz's Sarong Index. We account the number of sarongs in the household, divide by the number of people above the age of one, I think, um, and that was his measure of, of welfare. Now, as he realised, once we had good household surveys, we could do much better, much more comprehensive measures of consumption, but following a very sim similar principle. Yeah, the sarong index. But you may not realise, I didn't realise until I started reading uh, his collected works, which were left in my office, and I started reading a paper of his, which was his inaugural lecture at this university in 1966. Ungo Aziz had this terrific little vignette. He asked you to think about, do the following thought experiment. And there's a quote. This is from his inaugural lecture in 1966 at the University of Malaya. Uh, he asked you to think about people living in a remote tropical island with adequate food and shelter, no inequality, and no sense of poverty. And then he asked you to think, imagine that some of them, just one maybe, fly off to Singapore or Sydney. I love that he said Singapore or Sydney. I mean, Sydney's my hometown. Um, the pro and, he, and he said this, the problem would begin, the problem of poverty, uh, when someone from the island visited Singapore or Sydney and then became aware of what was lacking in the level of living of the island people. The main point here is that poverty is relative, a relative notion based on material inequality. And I think that's extremely perceptive. A great little vignette, and I'm going to use that a lot. The point, the way we would say this now, is that poverty is absolute in the space of welfare. This is a point that Amartya Sen has emphasised often. 
a, a, another quote from Amartya, an absolute approach in the space of capabilities translates into a relative approach in the space of commodities. Capabilities here meaning welfare. They're not exactly interpreted the same way by many economists, but that's not an issue I want to go into. We can talk about it if you like. Now what does that mean? Poverty is absolute in the space of welfare, but relative in the space of commodities. What I'm getting at is that ultimately poverty is about your well-being. And people are poor if their material well-being is too low. But if your well-being depends not just on your absolute level of consumption, but also on your relative position in society, then we can justify, on theoretical grounds, relative poverty measures in the income or commodity space when we have absolute measures in the welfare space. In other words, when I see somebody is absolutely poor, I'm not just looking at their, absolute, their own consumption, I'm looking at that consumption relative to their peer group or their own reference group in that society. Your reference group may be your, the kids you grew up with, it may be your, your cohort at work, or maybe your neighbours. Uh, well, we can think about it if we're talking about global poverty and inequality, we can think about the reference group as being the people, the citizens of your country. And you think about your welfare relative to them. Now, I, I didn't give this kind of idea any serious attention 15 years ago, but there's been so much research now that suggests that people, relative considerations are hugely important to people, and I think economists have got to recognize that. Relative incomes matter. People are often fond of quoting Adam Smith here. Adam Smith was a truly great thinker. Um, the, the idea of the invisible hand is, is a minor thing in, in, in Smith's thought. He's, he's amazing. I recommend Adam Smith to everybody. But at one point in The Wealth of Nations, he said the following, A creditable day laborer would be ashamed to appear in public without a linen shirt. He's writing in, in 1780s, right? a linen shirt, the want of which would be supposed to denote that disgraceful degree of poverty which it is presumed nobody can well fall into without extreme bad conduct. Extreme bad conduct is Adam Smith's late 18th century English for poverty in this context. So he's saying that you need a socially acceptable to be an adequate linen shirt in late 18th century England. Now if you go to any society you'll find the equivalent. My favourite example is Cat in Yemen. Cat in Yemen, this is that uh, fresh leafy stuff that you chew large gobs of for hours on end. Um, it's a mild stimulant. I, I tried it once, it didn't do anything for me. But people chew cat for long periods of time. If you go to a cat session, cat is a social inclusion need. It's obvious that to participate in Yemeni society, you have to participate in a cat session. I mean, there's male cat sessions, there's female cat sessions, and the two shall not be mixed. But in a male cat session, you go interactions all about um, business, fixing the school roof, whatever it is, and you'll get rich people and poor people in a cat session. It's a social inclusion need. The poorest 10% in Yemeni society, I, I think it's probably not true anymore, but hopefully Yemeni will get back on track, but um, it's awful what's been going on, but the poorest 10% are consuming about, putting about 10% of their budget into cat. Some people look at that and they say, oh, it's awful, terrible, how can they be so bad? But if you understand Yemeni society, you'll realize why that's so important. And anyway, there are many other examples. Uh, the type of clothes you wear, the type of food you, you know, social ceremonies, and so on, are all part of social inclusion. You can think of it either as relative deprivation, the concept that came, came out of economics and is popular in, in um, sociology and, 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 and psychology, or you can think about it in terms of social inclusion, the concept coming more out of sociology.
So we need to think about poverty lines in a slightly different way, well, radically different way, actually. So here I've given you the three concepts in play. Think of a graph of the poverty line against mean income, poverty line in a country, mean income in that country. The absolute line is fixed. If income is fixed in real terms, the absolute line is fixed in real terms. The official poverty line for, the, for Malaysia is fixed in real terms. It's, if you want to know, it's somewhere between six and seven ringgit per person per day. The official poverty line in Malaysia. Actually, stop and think. Come back to this. Seven ringgit per person per day. Okay, hold that thought. So the absolute line is fixed in real terms. A relative line rises with the mean. If you think that people care about their relative position in society, that's going to be natural. The, the poverty line is a money metric of your welfare. The poverty line needed to attain a fixed level of welfare below which you're poor will automatically rise with the mean in that society. There are two versions of that that I've drawn in this picture. One, the red one, is what I call strongly relative. And the, weak, the, the blue line is what I call weakly relative. And the difference here is the intercept. The reason for that intercept is clear. If you think about Adam Smith's linen shirt, that's, that's going to cost the same amount for the poorest person in late 18th century England as the richest person. A socially adequate linen shirt will cost them the same. If you think of cat in Yemen, a, a, a bundle of cat costs the same amount a poor person is a rich person. So the, the, the poverty line must have that, low, that intercept. For example, that intercept is the cost of a socially acceptable linen shirt. If you, don't, if you assume that cost can go to zero, you have what's called a strongly relative line. You may think that's a very strange thing. That is how poverty is measured in all of Western Europe. The OECD, except the United States, and Mexico has joined the OECD recently, they measure poverty by a strongly relative line where the poverty line is set at a constant proportion of the mean. It could be a constant proportion of the mean or a constant proportion of the median. The practice differs a little bit, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter for my purposes. They set the poverty line as a constant proportion of the mean. In other words, they assume that the poverty line goes to zero when the mean goes to zero. So first point, that doesn't make any sense. Precisely, exist the existence of relative deprivation, the existence of social inclusion needs, does not imply a strongly relative line. In fact, it, it, does, it categorically does not imply it. It implies a weakly relative line. It implies a positive intercept. One way of thinking about that is the elasticity of the poverty line. A strongly relative line has an elasticity of one. A weakly relative line has an elasticity of less than one. An absolute line has an elasticity of zero. Elasticity meaning for a 10% increase in the mean, what percentage increase in the poverty line do you get? For an absolute line, no increase. For a strongly relative line, 10%. For a weekly relative line, somewhere between the two. That, uh, what we talked about before, about growth reducing poverty, true if you use weekly relative measures, but not as true. Here I've given you two plots, one for absolute measures of poverty across the developing world. I'll come to M Malaysia in a moment. Across the developing world and for relative poverty measures. We're still seeing relative poverty declining, weakly relative poverty declining in, in the developing world with economic growth, but much less. An obvious why, because with that economic growth, the poverty line rises as well. How much it rises is that elasticity question they asked that I just talked about. So here in Malaysia, six to seven ringgit per person per day. That poverty line was set 40 years ago. Very hard for me to believe that that's still 
appropriate for Malaysia today. Appropriate when you take account of social inclusion needs, concerns about relative to bed deprivation, all of which are totally relevant to poor people too. Here's where Malaysia's current official poverty line that I showed you at the beginning of this lecture, here's where it what it looks like internationally. Right now, Malaysia's poverty line, that it, it, it turns into, it's $4 per person per day at purchasing power parity. Purchasing power parity rate is not four ringgit, roughly four ringgit per dollar, it's, it's about 1.5 ringgit per dollar, allowing for the fact that the cost of living is lower in Malaysia than the United States. Prices are lower. So a purchasing power parity index is based on the actual prices faced by people, not on official exchange rates. So Malaysia's poverty line, around $4 per person per day at 2011 ICP prices, um, is well below the line we would expect if I plot national poverty lines against the, the, the mean. Malaysia's poverty line is a lot lower than we would expect for a country at Malaysia's level of average income. It's now an upper middle income country in the World Bank's dubious income classification. It's well below. It should be about three times that. It should be about $12 a day if to be consistent with international practice. The average poverty line of countries in the region of Malaysia's average income, the average poverty line is about $12 a day. Yeah, international dollars. Um, that's a little subtle difference, US dollars, international dollars. That's about the fact that we're measuring poverty based on the prices in each country, but denominated in US dollars. Okay, so here's an example from Malaysia. I've constructed here relative poverty lines from Malaysia. This is only illustrative, just to, to show you what it looks like. I anchored the intercept to the official hardcore poverty line. It's about $2.50 a day per person. So the intercept, $2.50 a day, and I chose a slope of 1 and 3. I chose that slope so that I got to about $12 a day today. So I can solve the equation, I have enough parameters. The, 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 official, the relative poverty line from Malaysia would, would have to look something like that. I assume the absolute, the card core poverty line is the rock bottom, if you like, and I let it rise about one and three, a slope of one and three. So if the, if the mean rises by uh, 30 ringgit per person per day, then the poverty line rises by 10. Here's what it looks like. There's the picture I showed you before, the absolute poverty rate, and here's the weekly relative poverty rate. So by the weekly relative poverty rate, no question, Malaysia has not eliminated poverty. The official poverty rate today is 0.04% of the population. My weekly relative measure is about 20%. But both have declined. There's no doubt in my mind Malaysia has made huge progress against poverty. Also no doubt in my mind that economic growth has been an important part of that story. But if we switch to the weekly relative measures, Inequality rises in importance. Inequality now accounts for nearly half of the reduction in, absolute, in, in poverty measures. But over time, the trajectory is very similar. The two are tracing each other. They're almost parallel. By the way, this is a strongly relative measure, which I've set consistent with the East and Western European measure, 0.5 of the mean. Uh, that looks quite different. Uh, you may not, a couple of things. One thing to notice, if you use strongly relative measures, poverty fell during the global financial crisis. What? Of course it didn't. That's because it's a silly measure. I say, but I say silly in front of Eurostat as well. I, uh, um, not just... They, they know I, how much I think it's silly. Um, whereas my weekly relative measure behaves much more sensibly. Okay, I've said that. Um, 
this, uh, this point before we conclude with a few points on, on policy. Um, another po important part of, of research, and people ask me what, what should research on poverty, inequality, and social policy be doing going forward in this country, and, and that's a discussion we can all have, and I'm, I'm sure many people here have got uh, good ideas too. Data is a big problem. You can't do today research on poverty, good research on poverty and inequality with the type of data that's publicly available. You just can't do it. I went through agony to produce a lot of those pictures, right? And, and um, thankfully, the World Bank PovCalNet site is a huge asset. The official tabulations are very poor, in my view, and require a lot of work, and in some cases, impossible. You need access to the microdata. Malaysia has made huge progress in other things, but in terms of open data, it's got a long way to go. Access to complete microdata, complete, not just 30% of some sample or two or three variables, complete is going to be crucial going forward, and it's a high priority. Okay, a few comments on how we can do better. Um, I want to first point is, okay, you've, that's, that's a good, uh, hopefully an adequate overview of the, of the issues we're facing uh, and how we've, our progress over time. Um, two challenges, I, you notice um, two challenges here, a motivational challenge and a policy challenge. Actually, I should call that an implementation challenge. The motivational challenge is hugely important. We do not have a consensus today against inequality. I think it's partly because what I said before, the word is too big, means different things, different people. It's very hard to make any progress uh, on the policy front unless we develop that consensus. Uh, I think by unpacking the concept, we can start to get a clearer basis for agreement and hopefully that will start to happen. It's not very useful just to talk about this one word, inequality. Uh, I remember um, when uh, Barack Obama was, was President of the United States, we all remember that, um, but he invited a bunch of people to the Oval Office. I, I was not one of them, but I, uh, I heard about it. And he asked them, how do I talk about inequality in America without being accused of class warfare? That's a great question. I don't think they gave him any good answers, but it's a great question. And my answer would be, by avoiding the word, essentially, and unpacking it, particular dimensions of inequality can have huge salience politically. Inequality of opportunity can be a motivating force for progress, because most people will agree inequality of opportunity is bad. There are disagreements about inequality of results. Pretty soon after that, you'll realize that inequality of results is a huge, is a guaranteed creator of inequality of opportunity. So you will eventually start talking about inequality of results. But if you motivate it in terms of inequality of opportunity, you've got a better base for a consensus. And secondly, the implementation challenge, how can we have greater success? in the policies we, we pursue. And here, I'm, going to, I'm not going to say this is the policy you should pursue. It's, it hasn't worked. In the 40 years studying anti-poverty policy, I haven't found a magic bullet. I haven't found a, a single policy wherever I want to go is the exact thing to do. It's not there. Rather, it's adapting to circumstances and thinking about what is appropriate in the circumstance and thinking about the constraints on poverty reduction in that particular place. Okay, why do we care about inequality here on the, on the motivational challenge? Ethical concerns are, are very important. We cannot just ignore them. I, I don't think you can, you can legitimately talk about an agenda for action against inequality and focus, focusing solely uh, on, on the, uh, the instrumental arguments. The intrinsic arguments are about fairness of process, unequal opportunities in life, as I've mentioned, unequal outcomes, and objectionable specific inequalities. Everywhere in the world, inequalities of race, inequalities of gender, have a salience 
that is it, it motivationally very important and of course in reality hugely important for the people concerned. We care about ethnic and, and, and particularly racial, ethnic and gender inequalities much more than the dollar differences we actually see. They have a salient. For example, in this country, um, inequality between ethnic groups is actually quite a small proportion of overall inequality. And how you measure it, somewhere between 3 and 5% maybe. But it has a salient that is greatly underestimated by that number. Costs of inequality are important. There are reasons why there are instrumental arguments why inequality is a bad thing. We've realized, and 20 years ago, we might have thought that um, if, if you asked a development economist like me, maybe 20, 30 years ago is probably more accurate, um, uh, whether inequality is good or bad for economic growth, you'd probably say it's good for economic growth. Now, most would say it's bad for economic growth, or at least it's not relevant. We've learned that inequalities in various dimensions, including inequalities of opportunity, impede prospects for overall economic development. Largely because of our recognition of the role of market failures, particularly but not only in the credit market. If markets are failing, credit markets are not working, who gets locked out of the credit? Typically it's poor people. So the more poor people you have in the society, the more credit constrained people you have in the society, the more investment opportunities that don't get pursued, and the lower the overall rate of growth. There are other arguments too about market failures in land markets, labour markets. Once you relax the uh, textbook economics Econ 101 model of uh, perfect markets, we start to see all kinds of ways in which inequality is bad for economic growth. Okay, policies. The agenda for economic growth is, is hugely important, but it must be inclusive economic growth. It must be growth that helps reduce poverty. Growth has been a, an important proximate cause of the progress we've made in many areas, in human development, economic growth, and, and we, we don't have to hide from that fact, it's, it's the reality. How do we achieve more pro-poor growth? Here's my list of policies. Develop human physical assets of poor people. Make markets work better for poor people. A lot of our reform agenda in making markets work better is making markets work better for non-poor people. That's, that's the reality of a lot of reform effort. How do we switch that into reforms that make markets work better for poor people? Removing negative discrimination, race, gender, removing biases against the poor and public spending. There's still plenty of them. You look at tax policy, trade policy, regulation in every country. Investing in local public goods, local infrastructure, intelligent poor area development programs. Poor areas everywhere, lagging areas that aren't getting enough capital. So we've either got a combination of to get their, their uh, capital labour ratios higher, we've either got to increase their capital or reduce their labour, and we've got to really do both. Combinations of intelligent investment that also help people get out of poor areas. And fostering labour absorption from urban economies, making sure that, for example, when people move from rural areas to urban areas, they're not treated badly. They can get services in urban areas. They can. Uh, the, the regulation environment isn't trying to force them back home. In all of this, human development is going to remain important. Um, I, I qualify that because not in Malaysia, but in very poor countries, um, generalised expansions in education are inequality increasing. To get inequality down through education policy in very poor countries, You've really got to make sure that it's poor kids who are getting the schooling. In Malaysia, you've got a, a more fortunate situation. Generalised expansions in education are almost certainly inequality decreasing, and I think that's been a big part of what brought down inequality and prevented it rising. Okay, last, redistributing policies. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this because it's an area of policy that is neglected. 
Here, redistributive policies will include social protection. Social assistance is another term that's used. A set of policies where using uh, cash or kind transfers of some sort to try to alleviate poverty. I'd start here with some lessons from the advanced countries. Uh, you may not realize it, but you know, OECD countries spend a lot on reducing inequality, including the United States. The average Gini index for market of, of market income in the OECD is 0.49, about the level of Malaysia, a bit, bit lower actually. The average Gini for disposable incomes is 0.31, and that difference is due to redistributive efforts, progressive income taxes, public spending programs that, that try to reach poor people. They could do better. There's no country that's doing really well. Different countries doing better than others. But the overall effort is, is real and it's making a huge difference. In the developing world, we're seeing increasing use of these programs. 15 years ago, very few developing countries had social assistance. Today, almost all have something. Maybe a very small program, but there's something happening. The coverage has risen from very low to about 1 billion people. This form of assistance is growing at about 3.5% per annum. But here's the problem. You've already seen the numbers on the floor. It's just not reaching the poorest. And this is a graph, it's a slightly complicated graph, but on the vertical axis, safety net coverage. Safety net coverage for the population as a whole and safety net coverage for the poorest quintile. This is all constructed from household surveys using I've used the World Bank's Aspire data set and it's all public access. On the horizontal axis, GDP per capita. So there are a couple of things here. This is why I call this the um, uh, cruel irony. Uh, cruel, uh, the cruel irony here is that poorer places, poorer countries, are less effective at reaching their poor. Overall coverage rates of social protection are lower, and the, the coverage of the poorest 20% is also lower. As countries develop, they get better at reaching poor people. And those two lines start to diverge, the poorest quintile line and the population as a whole. So the cruel irony here is part of the reason poor countries are poor countries is they have less capacity for reaching their poor through social intervention. Another way of looking at it, one billion people living in poverty, one billion people receiving help, it's just a different billion. They don't intersect much. As countries develop, they tend to intersect more. Currently, the forms of social assistance in the developing world are raising the floor, but by only 1.5 cents per person per day average over the whole developing world. That's my calculation, stand by it. 1.5 cents per person per day. That's what we're doing, almost nothing. We're doing better when we spend more. Developing countries that spend more on social spending tend to be able to better reach the poorest. I've just plotted here the log of the floor post-transfers, the log of the lower bound of the distribution of consumption, plotted against the log of social spending. So that's good news. Richer countries also tend to have a higher floor, and consistent with what I showed you already. As countries develop, they're better at raising the floor. Another point, the bulk of that impact of more spending is by more spending. It's not by better spending. Just spending more, given how you spend it, is doing better. Of course, you can also spend more. You can also spend better, sorry. But the bulk is actually spending more. Okay, so a new, I believe there is a new role for redistributive interventions both in reducing inequality, absolute and relative, and in reducing relative poverty. 
But we're going to need more effective redistributive policies, that's clear. The policies we have now are not reaching the poorest very well, they're not having much impact. Um, the developing world is, is doing a, a poor job in this area of policy. And I think a lot of it is to do with administrative capabilities. If you go to a country like Sweden, which developed a fantastic welfare state, it started with much more universal programs. It didn't try fine targeting to reach the poor because it, Sweden knew it couldn't do it. You talk about Sweden in the early um, 19th century, they weren't going to try and do fine targeting to the poorest people. Or they, were, they tried to stay within their administrative capabilities. And as those capabilities developed, they developed better programs. In the developing world today, you don't see that. I see programs being pushed on poor countries, right, national institutions, which are just not within their capabilities. Not just in national institutions, but I see in India. Federal government in India pushing programs into poor areas of India that they just can't implement. And of course it all goes haywire. We get corruption, we get this, uh, a whole lot of problems. So administrative capacity. High marginal tax rates on poor people are a very bad idea. I'm all in favour of high marginal tax rates on rich people. But why is he saying that? High marginal tax rates on poor people? Who would do that? We do that. By fine targeting, this idea of perfect targeting, that for every dollar of income below the poverty line you'll get an extra dollar, that's a 100% marginal tax rate. From an incentive point of view, that's crazy. I think people exaggerate incentive arguments for social policy, but the idea of perfect targeting with its 100% marginal tax rate is just abhorrent. I mean, this is not something any intelligent person should think about. Information constraints are important too. This idea that we can finally target, we can reach poor people through social assistance, that they're all walking around with labels, I'm poor, yeah, and that's not the reality. The reality is severe informational constraints. We have to adapt to them as well. And of course financing, hugely important. Here's a menu of, of options and current policies. Um, here I'm not saying what I think we should do, I'm just being descriptive, but uh, public, poli uh, public services, target or universal, cash transfers, target or universal, um, conditional, unconditional. This is a range of things are done. Microfinance. Microfinance is getting a heavy critique right now. I don't know that it's going to survive it. Uh, workfare schemes. Uh, here I think potential, but we have to take full account of the costs of workfare programs, which we don't normally. Um, a minimum wage rate can be important if it's enforceable. Progressive income taxes, of course, and stronger tax enforcement across the board. I want to end with another observation, which um, almost end. In all of this, the idea again, that idea of fine targeting to reach poor people, if you can do it, great. Don't be, be careful on that marginal tax rate, the benefit of the store rate. But also, don't be, be less worried about universal programs or contingent, state contingent programs with universality within the kind of early Sweden model. When you do the calculations, and I've done it now for a number of programs as of others, it's, it's not clear. Once you take about all the costs of fine targeting, for example through a, uh, a judicial case transfer or a workfare program, it's not clear that you wouldn't do better with a more universal program, less finely targeted. And you're going to have more um, but you can have political economy advantages. Finally targeted programs, as Larry Summers once put it, tend to be pro, uh, fine, targeting pro targeted programs tend to be poor programs. Programs for the poor are poor programs, meaning that the political economy will tend to contract the program. A lot of the efforts that I see in social protection are essentially efforts to make sure we don't spend too much on social protection keep the cost down. That is not the objective. The objective is to minimise poverty. 
to reduce poverty. You're going to also need better information systems. This country has uh, quite good information systems for identification. Uh, and that can be a model going forward. India has just developed a it leapfrogged the entire world in its information system, which uh, through the biometric identifier, at, uh, um, which is, is a huge step forward. I'll just end with some recommendations. Um, first one is avoid slogans. My recommendations are not going to include any of the following. Tax the rich more. Spend less on rich people. Spend more on poor people. Target spending of the poor. Rely on local participation. These kind of slogans don't get us anywhere. There are a number of more basic, much more mundane things. First, policies need to be tailored to the realities of the setting. Seems obvious, but that's not what we're doing a lot of the time. Governments get overambitious. They think they can do all kinds of stuff that they can't do. Just be realistic about what you can do, but also work on developing your capabilities for policy. Expanding administrative capabilities, particularly in poor areas, hugely important. Tap local information, second recommendation, but with effective social state support. Too often we're seeing efforts at local participation which are abandoning local states. This is not helpful. You need the local states to come in to try to deal with elite, local elite capture problems, to deal with all the things that can go wrong with local level, community, with local level participation. You need strong support in guiding, monitoring local institutions and addressing grievances. Third, focus on poverty. Don't focus on finer targeting, as I've emphasised. The most finely targeted policy need not have the most impact on, pol on poverty. Targeting is not the objective. Poverty reduction is. Fourth, improve what I call the protection promotion trade-off. Try to find policies that achieve better protection at a given level of promotion or better promotion at a given level of protection. Promotion is about getting people out of poverty in a sustainable way. Protection is about dealing with the risks they face. All the time, poor people are facing continuing risks in their lives. We need policies that protect and promote, and good anti-poverty po poverty does both, but we also need to improve the trade-off the trade-offs that can arise if you protect people too much, they won't lift themselves out of poverty. Dealing with managing that trade-off is hugely important. Looking for smart social policies that provide, provide protection with promotion. Monitoring and evaluation are crucial. This sounds like an obvious thing, but it's not being done. I'm not seeing a lot of serious evaluation work in this country. I'm seeing almost none. Evaluation here doesn't mean randomised control trials. Don't fall for that. They can help. They can be a, a one thing on a menu of options, but look for the right evaluation instrument for the particular question you're asking. There's a menu of defensible options. And the last, learn from your mistakes. As somebody like me who evaluates and studies policy, social policy in countries, it's really, I can cry when I see how, how asymmetric it is. You know, if you find that a policy is working well, government is happy and they continue the policy, expand the policy. If you find that it's not working well, oh, nothing happens. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you know, you probably know what I mean. Bureaucratic inertia, Participant capture. These problems are, are, are chronic everywhere. There's an NGO called Give Well. Now, I have no affiliation with this NGO. I just happened to stumble upon this once. Give Well has on its web page a page um, devoted to knowing knowledge about its own mistakes. This is fantastic. You know, I don't just like this for the following reason, but it's also notable that the first mistake they list is they didn't hire a PhD economist to help them evaluate what they're doing. Great. <laughs> fantastic. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if every government in the world had a web page devoted to its own mistakes? 
Now, I'm not naive about this, but it's that the key thing here is that citizens should demand that governments do that, are much more open about their successes as well as their failures. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Revelyan, for the enlightening presentation. So many, so much insightful data, the ways that you look at things, interesting perspectives shared with us. It was very, for me, an eye-opener. Um, I've been working with uh, Yayasan for more than 10 years, and this is really going to be helping me, and I'm thankful also that Hilmi sent me the slides. I'm going to be looking at them, especially at the end. Um, see whether we can actually uh, do more, especially to lift that floor. I just want to ask, uh, before I open to the floor, um, Professor, um, that floor that you mentioned in Malaysia that has increased from 230 to 3, um, ha that has been um, uh, with inflation. How, how is it actually? Is it better now or, or not with inflation? Every monetary number that I gave you is adjusted for inflation. Everything is real. I, I, I don't even say this anymore, but everything is real between countries and over time, as best we can determine. Obviously, there are problems in price indices, the PPPs. I've written whole papers criticizing the price indices that I've used. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. OK, um, so uh, maybe I'd like to open uh, questions from the floor. Is there one, please mention your name, where you're from, what your question is. My name is Rajya Rathia, I'm from the faculty and from the university. Uh, thank you, Martin, for your wonderful lecture. I also like very much your reference to Adam Smith. I often told my students to also read the individual volumes rather than just the collective volumes. Um, I can see a connect in relation to some of the issues that you raised. And the current advisor to the Prime Minister, uh, he's been talking about relative poverty. We know that the Gini coefficient is uh, arguably the lowest, 0.401 in 2014 and 0.399 in 2016. Those are the latest figures. But his measure that, to me, somewhat approximate uh, the notion you are articulating on uh, relative poverty, which is the income the bottom 10% against the top 10% and the bottom 20% against the top 20%. He says it's been worth it. Uh, my question really is, I, I, I know you give to me exhaustive a uh, whole range of uh, recommendations as to how these issues should be addressed, but have you actually connected with the Malaysian scene here to see if there's something there that can be done uh, from, from your own observation? Thank you. I've um, met with the, the chief statistician and from Dossum we tried to meet or we hoped to meet with the uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs but um, that hasn't happened yet. Um, but um, so I guess the short answer is, is no. Um, uh, but um, I, I'm not um, so worried about that. Uh, I, I tend to think that the way you really influence governments is not a simple thing of having a meeting with the right people. It's engagement with the media, it's engagement with events like this. It's, I, 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 maybe I'm slightly naive here, but I tend to think it's by engagement with civil society that you improve things in government. Um, and I'm doing that. And the, today, the Edge is carrying a, 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 an op-ed I wrote that um, talks about the uh, questions whether Malaysia really has virtually eliminated poverty. Um, I know that's getting a, going to get some attention. So uh, I kind of knock on the back door and hope that um, somebody inside there will be listening. But um, and I, that's my. my by preference, although you know, I'm, I'm saying that I'm very happy to meet with anybody in government, it's just um, I don't see that as the only way of influencing them. Um, hello, my name is Bahami, <coughs> civil society, so I'm not attached to any uh, ministry and university. Uh, maybe about three questions, very sh short questions. Number one, um, as far as causes, uh, now I'm talking about policy prescriptions, not so much into your technical 
uh, data and so on. Um, would you consider behavioral, cultural, and religious elements as maybe three or some of the elements that would, you know, uh, would not allow a country to move from the property level or to higher level or at least on the basis of flaw? Uh, a case in point is when protestantism came in into Europe, and I think a lot of economies or even politi political analysis will subscribe that as the major revolution that make Europe to be uh, an advanced country or developed country right now. Uh, number two, it's about in inertia. I mean, if you are really at a low level of poverty, to bring up, to go up, it needs a lot more work, a lot more effort. But once you reach a certain level, I think it's a lot easier. So uh, do you think that's the case? And if so, you know, how can we do, go about doing that? And my third final question is, can a developed country who is not in poverty level go backwards and become poor? And under what circumstances? Thank you. They're a very interesting question. Um, all right, now first, behavioral, cultural, religious factors are always embedded in the um, processes that create and reinforce poverty. But the, I, I tend not to give them particular causal roles. I tend to think um, a lot of behavioral aspects and a lot of cultural aspects of poverty are as much um, effects as causes or the outcomes as causes. Um, and a lot of things, you know, for example, we used to talk about a culture of poverty in the literature in the United States way back. And, um, we also come to realize that a lot of things that we, we call the culture of poverty weren't the causes of poverty, they were the outcomes. They were produced by poverty. Uh, poverty could be, for example, extremely stressful. And a lot of the behaviors in terms of we might think of as could be excessive alcohol consumption, whatever. Um, you know, it's not that anybody condones that, but I think don't be, don't be, uh, understand where it's coming from, right? Um, a lot of work by psychologists and economists, Sandel and Nathan and, and others, on, on the ways in which the stresses of poverty in the human mind are huge. If you're worrying all the time about everything, paying the rent, feeding your family, it, 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 it swamps everything in your brain. It's, a, it's got a, a mental effect, which we come, might come to see as some sort of bad behavior, but you know, it's caused by poverty. Um, on your second, what you described is, is what we call in economics a poverty trap. And when I give, you know, I give a lecture course at, at Georgetown to undergraduates on poverty, it's like 32 hours, no more, of lectures on, this, on the topic I gave today, <laughs> right? And that includes a large chunk on poverty traps. And poverty traps are very real. We see them all the time. Um, there are situations where there's, what we say in economics, low-level attractors. Situations where you're caught, right? You, could, you would need a large injection of wealth, human capital or physical wealth or financial wealth, to get out of poverty. A small amount extra, you'll just fall back. There's a, a tipping point above which you'll go into a new trajectory. Now different people, different configurations, different tipping points and so on, and also very hard to empirically see this sometimes because when there are low level attractors like this we see behaviours, social and personal behaviours that try to hide this fact in a sense. But um, it, is quite, it is quite real, although it may not be entirely evident all the time in data. So part of, I would say, the promotion aspect of poverty, there are really just two aspects, in essence. And all promotional anti-poverty policy is essentially one of the following two things. First, getting people out of poverty traps. Second, raising their productivity, even if they're not in a product poverty trap. Pretty much everything is doing one of the two. If it's not, there's something wrong. Um, third, um, yeah, 
that's that's entirely possible. Countries can fall back. Um, give you give an example. I think it's happening in the United States right now. Um, I think poverty. We're going to see rising poverty. I pretty sure of that, but let's see how, what the data show. Um, we saw a small decrease for a while. Now you've also got to realize the official poverty measure in the United States, unlike Western Europe and uh, the OECD generally, the official poverty measures are absolute measures. They're real fixed, real poverty line over time. Uh, but even, and that I can explain why that is the case, it's a more an historical accident and politically, but, but um, we saw a little bit of progress in the Obama period. But I think a lot of what's happening is doing, undoing that. And I worry a lot about, for example, work requirements on food stamps. The Republican administration is pushing that a lot. And, and I think that will be poverty increasing. So yeah, it can happen. Um, obviously, in transition periods, the poverty rose in, in former Soviet Union sharply with the, um, in the transition. And it took 10 years more to undo that. Yeah, to get back onto a track of to lower poverty. Okay, other other questions. With uh, good question. Hello, hello. This is Kenneth from Penang Institute. Uh, there has been talk in America about raising the marginal tax rate to around seventy percent to finance a green public in investment or green infrastructure spending on all this. I'm just wondering how viable is this in in terms of tackling in income inequality and. Uh, I just wanted to ask about Professor views on how about raising, uh, how about by increasingly, by increasing the marginal income tax in Malaysia, would it be viable of tackling income inequality in Malaysia? Thank you. Um, raising the marginal tax rate at the very top, you know, that's not raising the, the marginal tax rate at the very top, um, absolutely. And it's entirely viable. The United States had a 70% marginal tax rate back in the 1960s, and it was quite good. Raised a lot of revenue, helped keep down inequality. Um, I, I, I'm all in favor of that. Uh, I don't think the behavioral responses will be, I think they'll, I think they'll be minimal, um, but I think the tax, the revenue implications and the implications for inequality will be, will be very um, positive. And um, so, full, full support. Uh, I'm not really qualified. To, I haven't looked at your income tax system. I've looked at the poverty numbers. I've looked at inequality numbers. Um, I don't have any reason. I don't know of any reason to say something different about Malaysia in this context. But I, I, I plead ignorance. Good morning, Professor. Thank you for the speech. I'm a member of uh, public. Uh, two questions, basically. The first one is uh, you talk about absolute view on the uh, poverty and relative view on, on poverty. Which one, I just wonder, has a better correlation or predictive power to other measurements like uh, longevity or social mobility or things like that? Which of these views has a better correlation or, or predictive power? That's the first question. The uh, second question is actually based on the, um, to what extent the discussion that we have here today um, is still relevant to the group of people like the natives, the aboriginals, whose uh, means to livelihood are still very different from, from what we see in small town or city. Thank you. We didn't Repeat understand your second. Uh, that means we still have a group of uh, citizens who are the natives who still uh, live by hunting, by, by so the aboriginals. Like the on so obviously they, they are the, one of yeah. the poorest, by our standard, the poorest yeah. people okay. in the country. So yeah. to what extent today's uh, discussion is relevant to their situation? Thank yeah. you. Um, on the first, um, hard, to, hard to give you a, a simple answer. Um, there are certainly situations where, when um, poverty measures become out of, become inconsistent with social norms. So, for example, you know, there's a, every country there's a, a kind of magic number, income level, above which people tend to think they're 
not poor, but below which they tend to think they're poor. And that, that's what I call the social subjective poverty line. I would argue in Malaysia that the official poverty line is well below the social subjective poverty line. That most people in Malaysia don't think that there's only 0.4% of the population is poor. In other words, that's a disconnect. So in that sense, if, if poverty lines become obsolete, they will automatically, the correlations with many things, will, will tend to fall. Uh, for example, in Malaysia, the poverty rate is supposed to be virtually zero, but the stunting rate in children is 20%. So, in some sense, that's now, you know, I, I find that 20% figure quite surprising, and I, I, I've advocated students, if students here are interested in researching, I think it would be a good topic, but stunt, stunting meaning low height, height for weight. Did I get that right, Kent? Height, height for age. Yeah, amazing how I keep forgetting that. But, but Ken, Ken Simler is often here to help me. <laughs> the kids are too short, all right? Stunted, okay? And stunting is a hugely worrying thing. There's a lot of evidence now that stunting in kids can retard their cognitive, non-cognitive abilities and so on. So it's a big worry. Um, so there's a disconnect or a lack of correlation, if you like, with a very important aspect of, of human welfare. Um, but there, you know, I don't want to generalize too much here. Uh, I, I think they can go out of, can, can become disconnected. Your poverty measures become disconnected with other aspects of basic human welfare, human capital development, and so on. And they, or it may not be. And also that it's not also that we expect a high correlation always. Income poverty may not come with human underdevelopment, but it will, maybe it won't. It obviously depends on the effectiveness of, of the state in delivering good health and education services. In some countries you've got a, um, a, a low poverty rate, but when you look at human development indicators in kids' health, nutrition, education, we see things are not so good. Maternal mortality rates that are too high, for example. So it's not that these things have to be correlated. It could be a, a very important in learning about policy in a particular case to look at those cases where they're not correlated in a sense, wh where we see poor performance in one aspect alongside bad performance in another. And that's really important. Yeah? So it's not the case that, that, that you, you can do very well at reducing income poverty, my topic today, but very badly in aspects of human development. Or you can do well in both. Yeah? The policy instruments tend to be somewhat different, and that's important too. That's also, by the way, a, a good reason for avoiding multi-dimensional poverty and inequality indices. These can be very deceptive by aggregating all those diverse things, forming a, an index, a composite index, which adds up income poverty with education or life infant mortality or whatever. You miss the differences important to keep them separate. Hi, uh, my name is Christopher from Kazana Research Institute. Thank you, Prof, for the very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, based on our own research, we see that for Malaysia, the labour income share has actually been in, uh, increasing uh, over the years, uh, unlike the trends that we see in other countries. Uh, and we argue from our research that this is actually good from a distribution standpoint. Uh, but my, my question is that, um, as we move forward to the next phase of Malaysia's development, where we need to move away from labour-intensive production to more capital-intensive production, uh, how does this technological ambition that Malaysia has square with the kind of inclusive growth uh, that you talk about, about the need to promote labour absorption of the poor? So do you see this as a necessary trade-off for Malaysia as we move forward, or is there another way to think about this? What, what is the trade-off exactly? Uh, between Malaysia's technological ambition of moving away from labour-intensive type of production to capital-intensive um, and the need to promote inclusive growth. I mean, yeah. is inclusive growth an impediment to our technological ambition? I mean, there can be a trade-off if you do it the wrong way. I mean, I think um, you want to see rising real wages in Malaysia, obviously. You want to see, you will see, and in due course, you'll start to see labour share falling, uh, and it won't be a bad thing necessarily. Um, social policy is also got to adapt to this. 
where it's a bad thing if you if you get out unbalanced in the process. All right. So, um, or if you force that technology change too quickly. Yeah. Um, a lot of governments get get wooed by the idea of and, and firms too of, of new technologies that will uh, vastly reduce their labour requirements and. Um, we have to be sensible about the economics, right? Given the wage rate, given the circumstances, given the, really the whole price and wage vector in the economy, you know, there's, a, there's a sensible degree of, of labour uh, intensity in any production process, and we have to find that, right? Um, most of the time that's happening, but mistakes do get made, and sometimes governments do push high-tech solutions in situations where it's actually better to let markets determine the degree of labour intensity and, and not push it so hard. But, but also the other side of this on social policy is hugely important. And, and I'm really worried there <laughs> because I'm not seeing, there's no question that we're going to see a huge reduction in, in labour intensity across the board globally going forward. Right? And social policy has got to adapt to that. And I think we're going to have to stop thinking about a world in which your, your job defines your, your worth. You know, and employment is essential for your, for your status in the society. We've got to think differently about the whole thing going forward. And that change is going to be, have to happen or we'll have a, a huge social problems, as you can readily imagine. Um, and I'm not seeing that happening. Uh, I think the basic income movement is, is making some good points on that. I don't agree that a basic income, universal basic income is a solution for all countries. I would be crazy for France to do a universal basic income. They can do much better than that already. But in some circumstances, if we were talking about Egypt rather than France, I'd say universal basic income is terrific. But the idea that universal basic income is a social policy response to new technologies going forward in the next few decades at a pace that could surprise us even now, uh, I think it's going to have an important role where basically we make sure that economic security is there for the bulk of the population, even if they can't find work and we stop thinking that finding work is the sole thing that, that defines them as human beings and worthy citizens. That's all got to have to change. Now, this is a long way off, maybe, but if we don't start thinking about all this now, I worry that uh, we'll face calamity. Hi, uh, my name is Dean from the Central Bank of Malaysia. Uh, I've got two, two questions. It's a very thought provoking. Yeah, so many questions to ask, but I'm going to limit it to two. Uh, first is, number one, where's the end? Like, how do we know as a country that we have effectively tackled this issue of income inequality? How do we know when we've actually gotten there? Is it when our actual mean income has reached the social or subjective poverty line, as you mentioned, or is it when we see there's no income inequality, everyone is paid equally? Is, it, is that the end? Um, number two, it's about how do we help those who don't want to help themselves? The issue of mindset. Um, I regularly get involved in feeding the homeless kind of activity, and there have been people who have been on the streets of Kuala Lumpur for the past 11 years, for example. No doubt, every night, you know, day in, day out, we give them food uh, at night and we help them look for jobs. But they don't hold on to the jobs. Um, it could be some mindset issue and sometimes we put them in a facility um, that gives them shelter and food and all they need to do is to show effort that they actually go out and look for a job and for the Muslim, they, they have to, you know, follow this um, five time prayers a day. But they feel constrained. Um, they feel being watched and in the end they'd rather be on the streets again than be in the facility with shelter and food provided. So how do we help those who don't want to help themselves and we, with certain mindset? You know, there's a big difference between poverty and inequality in this respect to your first question. Yes, we want poverty to go to zero. And this relates to your second question. I'd argue almost nobody wants to be poor. I mean, maybe there's a few people with some psychological problems, but you no, know, very rare. Okay, so we want poverty to go to zero. We don't want inequality to go to zero. You probably don't want to live in a place where inequality is zero. Uh, 
you know, now I'm an economist, so obviously I'm going to make incentive arguments about all kinds of things and worry about incentives like crazy. But I, but I think as an economist, they also tend to get exaggerated. But the incentive arguments about here would be very compelling. And so you just don't want that, right? Um, that's not our problem. I don't believe reaching zero inequality is happening anytime soon. So we're a long way off. So it's like we have too much inequality in most countries, I'd argue, from the point of view of both our ethical concerns and our concerns about outcomes, the various uh, instrumental ways in which inequality impedes social progress, makes it harder to achieve cooperation in society, makes it harder for people to escape poverty. All of those reasons are in play at very high levels of inequality. Now, where this magic number might be between the two, you know, inequality zero and inequality one, the sum optimum, is going to vary from place to place, and how to, where it is, oh, we're never going to know. We just know which direction we want to go from now and move in that direction. So I'd worry, where is it going to end? Well, I don't know. For poverty, it'll end at zero. For inequality, it won't end at zero, and it hopefully won't end at zero. Um, two, your second point, um, this is a, a, a small subset of the poverty problem, is the first thing to recognize. Uh, important, but it's there, but the, uh, like for the homelessness problem in the United States, and it's a, it's a different kind of problem often, right? Often involving psychological assistance, often involving multiple forms of intervention. Um, some of the programs in the world, like Chile Solidario in Chile, and a lot of effort trying to bring together very intensive social work efforts at, at people in these conditions um, with some evidence of, of success and, and sometimes not, it's, it's not clear. But I want to emphasize that's a small part of the poverty problem in any society. And it sometimes is the part that gets most attention. And when I talk about the floor, I'm not necessarily talking about some of those people will be there, but I'm talking about a lot of others who really want to do better in life and really could benefit from help. When you're talking about people who don't want help, well, you know, it's probably best not to, to let them be and, and to find ways that um, work with them. Now, in my country, Australia, if I went back to Australia, I haven't lived there for 40 years, but if I did, the problems of, the pov of poverty in the Aboriginal community in Australia would be top of my list. But they're really hard problems, too. That's a, a different set of problems, but there's a range of things, range, a range of ways in which our, and the nature of our interventions in anti-poverty policy have actually made things worse. All over the world we see, with, particularly with minority groups and, and poverty problems, we often see efforts to help those groups which are just not well considered. It doesn't look at the problem from their point of view. Uh, for example, Dominique has done work on the minority groups in Vietnam and, and a lot of the efforts by the Vietnamese government to try, try to deal with their poverty was to try to, in, in, in Vietnamese you would say, to try to act them, make, make them act kin, to make them act like the majority to adopt the same behavior, to adopt the same economic model as the majority. And you were just ignoring their own traditions and their own culture. And it was being, it wasn't working. Could it well be making things worse? So a lot of the time it's, a, it's intelligent adaptation to the particular context, the particular society you're talking about. So I've covered a range of issues here, but I wanted to broaden it to point out that you know, this is one aspect. And it's a, it can be a very difficult aspect, but it's not easy. Hi, I'm Hui Yin from Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. So uh, one of the key policies in addressing poverty and inequality in Malaysia is racial-based affirmative action policy. And there's been discussion in moving our attention towards pro-poor policies, like what you mentioned in your presentation. But the response has been mixed. So how do you think pro-poor growth and distribution policy is viable in Malaysia, given our social and political context? Um, well, two points I'd make. First, that uh, affirmative action and uh, efforts at reducing uh, racial, ethnic, gender disparities 
It can be very important for many reasons. You know, social solidarity, they can also create social frictions, but social solidarity, the, rea the policy reaction in new economic policy after, in 1971, after the rise in 1969, is perfectly understandable and perfectly, in my view, defensible. Okay? Whether it's outlived its usefulness or not is a question I would also leave open. I, I, I think there, there is a legitimate question of whether it's still necessary. But, second point, as an anti-poverty policy, um, I don't think it was that important. It, was, it helped the effort to reduce ethnic inequality, the difference in average incomes by ethnic group in, the, in Malaysia. It helped in the fight against poverty, but it was relatively small. Um, much more important was overall economic growth. If you think about it as overall economic growth versus reducing the disparities in mean income between ethnic groups, much more came from overall economic growth. And second to that, reducing inequality within ethnic groups. Each of the major ethnic groups, the Bumiputra, the Chinese and Indians, have seen falling inequality within their group. That has first economic growth, second inequality within groups, and third inequality between groups in terms of the success Malaysia has had against poverty. And that third one is there, right, reducing Inter-ethnic inequality has helped reduce poverty, but let's put it, make it very clear, it's, it's relatively small, its impact. Okay? In other words, a lot of the benefits went to non-poor people within the Bumiputra in particular, and a lot of poor people within Chinese and Indian communities were not getting enough help. Um, so, now another final point on that. One of the interesting things if I, in the calculations I've been doing on this country, one of the interesting observations is the reason reducing ethnic disparities was not as important to poverty reduction as you might imagine. The reason isn't because there was so much success in reducing disparities between groups. Actually, no. It's not that as you saw those from my graph, we are seeing some, definitely seeing um, convergence in proportional terms, we're seeing divergence in absolute terms. It's not the answer, the reason why it, uh, reducing ethnic inequality was not quite as important as you imagine. The reason is that, is that, that lack of redistribution rather than excessive redistribution. Another way of saying that, the elasticities of national poverty to ethnic redistribution in this country are just as high now as they were in 1970. The elasticity, in other words, the extra, the impact, the reduction in poverty you get from a, ticket, from a reduction in, in inequality between groups. Okay? Not that the elasticities have fallen, as you'd expect, but it's still pretty high. So that's a qualification that people don't seem to fully appreciate context today. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you to everyone who came today. Thank you for all your very, very interesting questions. Thank you to Professor Valian for, uh, for his public lecture. Thank you to Dr. Samsul Baria and her team from the uh, Unku Aziz uh, Center for Development Studies for arranging for this public lecture. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your very enlightening session. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Rohana Jani, Dean, Faculty of Economics and Administration, to give away token of appreciation to Hajayatela Zainal Abidin and Professor Martin Ravalian.